It's this revolutionary music that literally changed the face of popular music. There was a school of thought that ran the 90s, and they ended it. Bands like Apples, Neutral Milk, Olivia Tremor Control, Elf Power. Welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries brought to you by Treble Media. We're at Rock Docs Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Blue Sky, Threads, I guess. I don't know. There'll probably be something new by the time you hear this. But uh, anyway, come find us. Say hi. We have a such an exciting special guest uh, today, uh, Lance Bangs. He's, uh, we're so excited. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, we're here to talk about the Elephant Six Recording Company documentary coming soon to a theater near you. Uh, without further ado, here is our conversation with the legendary Lance Banks. Okay, welcome to Rock Docs. Uh, I'm David Lizabram here with my co-host Andrew Keats. And uh, yeah, uh, as mentioned, we are here with our very special guest, Lance Banks, who we are very excited to have here. Uh, Lance, say hi. Hello. Good to speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay um yeah uh we've been talking to you for a while about having you come on and um we are uh, obviously big fans and thrilled to have you uh with us yeah so um you have um you know we could spend hours and hours going through all the many awesome cool things you've done and we could talk about some of that but um kind of right up front the, the precipitating event here was uh that um coming out soon we don't know exactly when um august is, 25th uh, Oh, uh, I lied. August 25th. Okay. Um, coming out soon, as you're hearing this, because uh, this will probably come out in August, um, the, uh, the, the, your, your film, um, The Elephant Six Recording Company, um, which is uh, about The Elephant Six Recording Company. So um, <laughs> let me just ask, because we temp- sometimes we'll, uh, we'll kind of do this at, at the top. Um, so Andy, how much familiarity did you have with Elephant Six, these bands, et cetera, before watching the film? Less than I would have liked. I have, you know, I, I certainly knew Neutral Milk Hotel very well. I knew the Olivia's. Uh, I knew Apple's a little, uh, and that was about it. So I was, I was excited to learn more through the movie, and uh, feel like I did, and I feel like it's going to be something that uh, nurtures a, a, a desire to go quite a bit deeper now. So, and and luckily, there's a lot of music out there to keep, go very deep on, because boy, did they make a lot of music. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So it's it's a film about um, sort of a loose connection of artists. Uh, uh, Lance, I'll let you describe it. Just kind of uh, you know, kind of upfront, what it's at least sold out is is a um, a group of artists, some of whom were working in uh, primarily in Athens, Georgia, some of them uh, in Denver. It mostly covers their work in the in the '90s, although it goes a little bit beyond that. And you know, the headline acts are like you said, Neutral Milk Hotel, Apples and Stereo, Olivia Tremor Control, Elf Power, and then many, many, many others. Um, so I guess the first question I Lance is like how you came to be involved with this scene, because you're also in the film at some point and you're, you shot a lot of the footage. You're very involved with, you know, this is not something that you just dropped into. So how did you come to know these people? I was, uh, already living in Athens, Georgia. I went there in, in 1990, uh, as a 16 year old and then turned 17 in Athens and just, was fascinated by the music scene. Athens had already throughout the 1980s been the place that Pylon and the B-52s and R.E.M. and 5-8 and Mercyland and all sorts of great artists and bands were, uh, were active throughout the eighties. And it had become like culturally prominently known so that if you were into alternative music or college radio, Athens was one of the cool cities to potentially go to. If you were a touring band, it's a place you'd want to go play at the 40 watt club or the downstairs of the Georgia theater. Um, and so I think that was part of the draw that several interesting people who were young in high school in Ruston, Louisiana, Jeff Mangum, Will Cullen Hart, and Bill Doss, and Robert Schneider all sort of knew each other there. And three of them, four of them, you know, ended up coming to Athens, Georgia, maybe 1993 is when they turned up. And Jeff Mangum, who went on to do Nurture Milk Hotel, Will Cullen Hart, and Bill Doss, who ended up doing the Libra Tremor Control, they formed a group together called Synthetic Flying Machine. They also sometimes performed as Cranberry Life Cycle. And they would play at like a, a Mexican food restaurant called Frioleros uh, or a place called The Downstairs. And they were uh, fascinating and amazing because like a lot of the bands in Athens were trying to rebel against like the melodic jangly sound of R.E.M. by being very noisy and aggressive in the early 90s, sort of like 
what was going on on amphetamine reptile or touch and go in other parts of the country, kind of heavier, noisier, deliberately non-melodic music. And they were coming in from Ruston, Louisiana and doing things that were melodic and had surreal imagery, kind of like psychedelic ideas within the lyrics and kind of switching instruments or jumping from one, you know, Jeff would be on the drum kit and then he would be like hitting a bass, like kind of switching around what they were doing in a way that was very compelling and fascinating and interesting. So socially started filming them and the band Elf Power uh, during that time period and then ended up becoming like over time housemates with Jeff Mangum and Laura Carter, who was in a band called Elf Power, Julian Coster uh, and his partner, Robbie, that were in Neutral Book Hotel, but also had a group called The Music Tapes. Uh, just like a, a lot of like overlapping social worlds of these musicians. And we would kind of get together weekly and have these like potluck meals where everyone would bring stuff and bring magnetic tape that people have been recording to, and then kind of cut that up and put that in a bowl and then tape that together and put it into a recorder playback. And you would hear like fragments of underwater sounds and then like a saw being bowed. Just like amazing, interesting music, concrete type of pieces. Uh, a lot of colorful visual artwork going on. There were poets, there were people that did noise collage, just a, a kind of its own fascinating world of characters and sounds and sights and, and compulsively making things. While that was going on in Athens, uh, one of the other original high school people from Ruston, Robert Schneider, had moved out to Colorado where he started the Apples and Stereo. And Robert's the one that came up with the name and the idea of the Elephant Six Recording Company is sort of an umbrella to put that logo on these different releases that were coming out. And there were like, you know, actual record label for a while of like seven inches and cassettes coming out that he was overseeing. And that kind of triggered the imagination of a lot of people who were following independent music culture in the 1990s to kind of track all these different things and realize that a lot of the same band members were like overlapping the people in Athens were a bit mysterious. They would kind of like hide their identities or uh, not do like clear professional band photo type of pictures, but rather be wearing masks or animal heads or not having a photo or just hands on a piano in the back of a head, things like that as their like promotional photographs. <laughs> um, so it was, it's kind of like its own world that it built and it was fascinating and it was something that I was moving around while making other films and kind of documenting and doing audio recordings and, and filming live performances and shooting Super 8 of everything as it was going on. So a lot of the the filmmaking kind of began in that era of the 1990s, I would say. Yeah, and you you know, it, 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 the, the film is interesting because uh, I assume this is conscious. It, it, it doesn't um, do what a lot of... Uh, documentaries do particularly when they're um talking about a scene or something where it does a lot of place setting and, and says tries to beat you over the head with reminders about what else was going on in popular music at the time or what else was going on in um other cities um it you know your movie seems um to be confident that the you've got the you've got the interesting people that you want to be talking about, and that and, and that that's where you spend your time, particularly in the the beginning of the movie while you're setting up what's happening with Element Six. Totally, and so uh, C. B. Stockfleth and and Rob Hatchmiller and Greg King, the other filmmakers that kind of put this all together. Uh, I think collectively we didn't want to have something that was like a traditional. And then in 1972, this person was born, and they mm -hmm. yeah, you know yeah. do like a kind of a chronological uh, Wikipedia entry about explicating everything, um, but rather to kind of make this montage that had personalities and characters and sound and overlapping stories and, and things going on. I think that someone would learn a lot of information that they didn't previously know by watching the film, but they also might just experience it as a bunch of sounds and personalities and, and great combination of visuals with great music. Yeah. And, you know, you have um, a, a really, you know, you have a, a couple talking head segments in the movie, you, you yourself actually on, on screen. Um, one that that really stands out is um, discussing the, the writerly um, look and feel of Athens at the time. These, these, you know, describe these old houses with the high ceilings and the um, tr the trees that had the dangling leaves and light would peer through and and that that sound sort of 
came through in the music that the Elephant Six folks were making. Um, I, I, I couldn't help but notice that that look and feel is is very present in the movie, that that is the look and feel of the movie as well throughout, that you're sort of immersed in um, exactly that sort of writerly setting that you describe. Yeah, I'm so glad you responded to that section of the film and that you mentioned that in this conversation. Athens is a singular place. It really is special, it, enduringly so. It's not ruined. It's not overly destroyed. You can still go there and kind of see the tree that owns itself and see kudzu overtaking houses and and get a sense of like how you're you're not in Atlanta. You're not in Chapel Hill. It's its own distinct regional place. Yeah. Um, the way that the light moves there, the vegetation, the sound of the insects, the sounds of the trains passing. It really does add to this place that you can be reflective, you can take time and write, you can generate things, you can find like-minded friends and like live very inexpensively in a group house and start a recording project or a band and make a seminal recording together. Um, I, I still find things going on there now with younger people that are creating new things that may or may not ever spread beyond that region, but are worth taking the time to listen to and, and track down and, and be part of. Yeah, I think one of the one of the reasons why um, the movie is so um, kind of distinctive, um, which Andy alluded to, is is the the look of it. And, and part of what you said, Lance, is um, you know, I think we think of this as a music documentary, and these people are musicians, and they're known for their you know recordings and performances. But really, it, most of the people that we see in the movie, um, you know, then and now are, I guess I would say, multimedia artists. You know, whether they're painters, whether they're uh, you know, doing uh, sound experiments, um, which sometimes translates into some of you consider music or not, uh, film, photography, all these different things. Um, and, you know, for one thing, that makes the movie, uh, you know, that makes for a lot better content for a movie <laughs> um, than just, uh, you know, people in a nondescript place who happen to make music that was interesting. Um, but, you know, how do you, how were you thinking of them at the time? Um, you know, were you thinking of it as a music scene or really as a community of artists and some of whom made music and that, you know, sort of got beyond what was uh, happening right there? Yeah, I definitely felt of it as a community in resistance to the larger culture of people who had decided to kind of deliberately live in this community, whether you might want to call it a collective, but like people that were integral to what was going on who weren't like lead guitar players, but did, you know, washing machines as um, mm -hmm. percussion or built fabric tunnels in the middle of what would normally be a rock venue, like the people in the Dixie blood mustache, like that all felt completely essential and integral to what was going on, even though they weren't like a lead guitarist. I got a, so, a real laugh out loud line at the deadpan delivery of Dixie Blood Mustache is a 12-piece appliance orchestra, period. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. And they were amazing. And, like, I, you know, there's not really records to buy necessarily uh, that explicate that. But I promise it was amazing. And the footage of them in the film, I'm so glad that that's in there now and people will see it. I want to um, ask about some of the, you know, like Andy said, you it, the, mus the movie doesn't do a lot of that kind of situating but I do, I was kind of curious um, about some of the kind of things that led up to this or either things that were happening before or at the same time, because it stands out to me that like, in terms of the music, um, the kind of focus on 60s pop, lo-fi recording, et cetera. I mean, I'm, you know, people who listen to the show know I never shut up about Guided by Voices. It seems like they were doing something similar, or the different kind of tone maybe, but um you know, but it seems like maybe it wouldn't have it wouldn't surprise me if these people were listening to Propeller or, you know, B thousand, you know, when they when they were kind of cooking up their concepts. And also at the same time, you know, one of the most famous music documentary, uh, you know, anti heroes of all time, uh, is Anton from Brian Jones Sound Massacre, and that's you know more or less contemporary. It's happening in L.A., but again, it's a focus on you know pop 60s psychedelia you know the not a slick recording type of situation so i'm just kind of curious whether there, there was crossover or whether this was just all happening in such a bubble that it just you know they weren't even aware of what was happening no like the other interesting thing is that while some of these people were in high school in ruston louisiana uh 
there's a radio station there. I think it's KLSU, maybe. That's the you know sort of regional college radio station that Jeff Mangum would go DJ at, and they would they would bring indie rock touring bands who are passing through to get from you know the middle of the country over to the southeast. It wasn't that much of a detour to come play a show at at Ruston, even though it's like a fairly small college town. And so Sebado or uh, Calvin Johnson or Dub sure. Narcotic or things like that, and I'm sure Got It By Voices, you know, could easily make a tour stop there or be played on the radio or come do an, you know, acoustic set for the radio or whatever. And so there was like a deep knowledge of uh, like the Tall Dwarves and the Flying Nun recordings out of New Zealand and things that were happening on Merge and indie rock stuff like Sebado and Got It By Voices that they would have been aware of and conscious of. Um, they also had kind of like a deep love of things that were more challenging. Um, they loved Song for Shay by uh, Charlie Hayden. They loved Alice mm-hmm. Coltrane. They loved Pierre Henry, the kind of music concrete, like, like just, you know, sound collage <laughs> stuff. Sure. It was really amazing. Right. So, Silver apples, that kind of thing. Exactly. Totally. So there is, you know, is a pretty great, deep love of, of different kinds of sounds and music among these people. I would say that Robert Schneider had like a very strong love of like Beach Boys and Brian Wilson arrangements and that sort of like tape recording catharsis that you can get into. And the things that happened with like the Beatles being able to do multi-track recording at EMI and uh, Abbey Road. But yeah, there was also this kind of indie rock thing that you picked up on where I'm sure that, you know, they were definitely aware of Guided by Voices and Sebado and that kind of pavement and that kind of melodic stuff. Yeah. All right, so I, I'm often one to to pull us off the off the tracks here, and I'm I'm going to do it now because as, <laughs> as it. Da- David has David has has mentioned what else is going on outside of Athens. Uh, I want to ask about something that was going on inside of Athens at this okay. exact time. Did did um did any of these folks ever have reason to cross paths with, play with, uh, even you know be in the same room with Widespread Panic? That's a great question. I think the connecting thing was Vic Chestnut. Uh, Vic Chestnut mm. did the record mm. Brute with Widespread Panic. And Dave Schools is a great music fan and music lover that was at some of these shows and supporting, you know, the other weirder things that were going on outside of his own, uh, you know, if you perceive like what Widespread does as sort of like a quote jam band or whatever. Like Dave Schools is just like a great music fan that would be supporting yeah. all sorts of things and checking out things with a great curiosity and buying records and so their love and regard and collaboration with Vic Chestnut. And then Vic worked with uh, Jeff Mangum as a friend and was like, you know, definitely social with him and uh, the Taylor family, like Astra Taylor. And Elf Power made a record with Vic Chestnut as well. Uh, those are sort of like the two bands that did full recordings where they involved Vic were Widespread Panic on Brute and Elf Power with, with Vic. So yeah, that would probably be like the closest connecting link and then dave schools just as a great guy and music fan that was following what was going on uh, that's awesome yeah i mean because it's the overlap between panic's rise and and what was going on with elvin six is you know it's exact basically you know yeah 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 it depends i guess what kind of career you want to have you I, know i should say david uh you know there's a, a a great video out there of lance um on uh, a show called Channel Five, um, giving his his unvarnished opinion opinion about um, our friends Fish, <laughs> and uh, you know, David, you would I think you would appreciate his his uh, trenchant commentary on on the band that that I like and that you do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, yeah. maybe we'll link but, to that. <laughs> but it seems it seems like the uh, seems seems like Panic is, is a little bit closer though, so that's good to hear. <laughs> okay, we're pro panic here. <laughs> All right, let's get let's get back to Elephant Six though. <laughs> okay, okay, got it. Um, so um, yeah, I'm curious about um, you know, we're this isn't like a full review kind of conversation, so I, I'm you know, but I am kind of curious to to know like the people who uh, you know most of the people uh in this film um are still with us and um still making music art you know in various capacities. What what's been the reaction? Um, you know, has it been uh, warmly received or I'm not trying to call anybody out or anything, but like generally speaking, this is, you know, focusing, a t- this is going to focus attention on people that, you know, maybe haven't um, really been in the spotlight for many years um, and, or maybe never really were given their due. 
And um, kind of curious what people think about that. Yeah, you know, th there's a lot of personalities within all the people that were in the umbrella of Elephant Six. Uh, I would say that generally the people that have their stories told in the film are in a good place right now and are happy to have this coming out and to see their friends all celebrated and well represented with the interviews that they gave and the conversations and what they chose to share or reveal in the film. Um, there's great footage of Bill Doss and Will Cullen Hart working on what would have been the third Olivia Tremor Control record. So music fans will get to hear some of that unreleased music that they were working on. Um, there's interviews from Jeff Mangum on different radio sessions that uh, we kind of pieced together to kind of tell his perspective and his thoughts about things, which is, is very great to hear him speaking in that form. Um, Elf Power are a band that I've always loved and cherished that are touring currently. And I think that people may deepen their love or awareness of Elf Power from seeing this film. Um, there's just so much great music that you can kind of rediscover Robert Schneider is such a compelling personality and such a charismatic speaker and so positive and, and generates so much uh, love and, and electricity with what he does that you get reminded of like the infectiousness of his work by seeing his brain on fire in this film. So Dr. there's Robert a lot Schneider. to it. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Like Dr. Robert Schneider. Um, it's great to, to have everyone, you know, it's also just you're back hearing and seeing the sounds of the 1990s and early 2000s and things that, people trying to approximate or make reference to now in their own work. Like there's psychedelia reimagined in a non sixties way in King Gizzard and all these other things that are out there in the world now that um, seeing this kind of iteration of it from the nineties and early two thousands is, is pretty rewarding. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it, it kind of hits you over the head how um, if it, if it wasn't prevalent at the time, how much the sound of this music is prevalent in what you know became indie rock after it, and how, yeah, you know how how pervasive it became really, um, and and I I don't know that it you know it really was at the time that these guys were doing it. Yeah, I didn't feel to me at the time that you know the larger national music press was understanding how great some of these things were, mm -hmm. um, but I think now if you listen to Again, like if you listen to an Alex G record, it would feel like, oh, like mm. these tape effects and things and melodies are not completely alien. This is like stuff that was being played around with by the Olivia Tremor Control. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the most kind of beautiful, compelling, interesting people in the film and presumably in your own personal life um, is um, Will Cullen Hart um, from a. Olivia Tremor Control. And um, I guess I just want to know, like, how is he doing? Because I know that he, he had some, he's had some health issues. Yeah, he's had some health issues. He, uh, I think it's publicly disclosed that he has multiple sclerosis. And so that affects his uh, speech or muscle control sometimes. But his mind is alive and active and he's making paintings and making music and uh, doing well and, and focusing on health. And getting to see him in action in the film is one of the rewarding things about it. Yeah. Yeah. He, his, his personality in him as a, a character really uh, comes alive in the film. Totally. Sure. And, and, and the, uh, the sort of interplay of, of uh, Will and Bill um, is, you know, really uh, a, a, a fun dynamic. Um, it also, you know, David and I talk about this in different episodes all the time with movies is just really memorable moments, really, um, you know, anecdotes that that sort of transcend the the telling of them and you know there's one in this movie that is just so good is um you know robert and jeff working on that their album and and yelling to each other through the through the wall while they're in bed and uh you know during their in, in their sleep maybe you know one or both <laughs> of them are asleep and they're they're calming each other down we're, we're making rock history it's fine just relax go back to bed <laughs> yeah it's gonna um, be okay yeah, it's such a it, it's 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 beautiful. It's funny, and you know, it, it sort of just um, brings to life the making of that album. Yeah, I that you know, we should say that even if you're not familiar with these bands or these records, or you know, that's not your era mm -hmm. or whatever. Just as anyone that loves music and documentary and and the breadth of rock and roll and popular 
recordings and experimental music and all that. It's just full of great stories like that and humanity and people that you want to root for and hear their work and see their paintings and see the things that they built with their friends. Yeah, we talk, we, you know, we always say that, you know, whether certain movies are, are like, it's just a, a good hang. It's just easy that you want to hang out with the characters in the movie. And, and that's true of this, although I, I think it's more than that here. It's like, that's actually the subject matter, you know, the, the fact that this is a good hang. It's, it's more than just uh, a, a, a trait of the movie. It's like, that's actually the subject of the movie that the, the, the people and what they were working on was so collective and they're sort of collaborative exploration was so part of what was happening that it sort of draws you in and makes you feel like you're part of it again, watching the movie, you know, talking about these potluck dinners with, um, uh, where everybody was talking about geodesic domes and, 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 <laughs> and share and sharing the magnetic tape and, and whatnot. It, um, just sort of being there really does, uh, come through in the film, I would say. Yeah. The best case scenario is that people watch this film and are inspired and that, five people in Santa Fe start yeah. supporting each other and making print collage fanzines and playing with a tape recorder and things expand from there. Yeah. I was going to say exactly that. Like it, it is sort of inspiring. It's the kind of movie where because pe the people in the movie, they're all extremely talented, but they're making things with very limited resources, you know, like in terms of money, access, everything else. It's just, they're taking everything around it and everything around them and turning it into art. And because of that and because of Robert Schneider, particularly seeming like this ringmaster, like, you know, motivational speaker almost, you know, and um, in a good way. And, you know, and it, a philosopher, the, 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 the multi-track yeah. recording as a time machine, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But it's just watching the movie like it made me want to, like, you know, turn off the movie and go make something. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we're doing that now. So, you know, mission <laughs> accomplished. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Unfortunately, it turned into a podcast. But, <laughs> the worst case scenario. But, um, no, it, it, it has that kind of inspiring quality where you're like, um, well, you know, not, not to diminish the people involved, but it's like, well, I could do something too. You know, if they could do it, I could do it. And it, and it, that's, um, it's kind of rare as opposed to a movie about, you know, rock stars that are, you know, sort of like, impossible to even imagine touching that level of uh fame and fortune you know it's not a big fame and fortune kind of movie for the most part <laughs> absolutely um can we do a quick uh speed run through the uh the the the, the life and career of lance bangs do you mind <laughs> yeah let's try um uh yeah i mean we could i don't want to do uh do a chris farley show and be like uh <laughs> remember the time you hung out with this person but um you know or whatever but um yeah, I wanted to talk about the um the Slint movie. Um Yeah. I I I I actually hadn't watched that. And part of the reason I hadn't watched it ever um was because I kind of liked the mystery um of them and um so, you know, but you know, then we were going to talk to you. So I was like, "All right, let's watch it." And um you know, not that it spoiled anything or you know, the mystery, but um it's it's such a cool like especially the very beginning when it's almost like a detective story. Um, about this like mysterious band that you track down and and like how did you get them all to to kind of open up about this part of their lives? It took time. They were, I think they would admit they are distinct, slightly peculiar human beings who all kind of found each other and made this remarkable music from pretty early on. Like they were they were kind of children when some of them started making songs together and recording stuff and touring and playing live. And they were similarly like non-promotional, non, uh, there isn't a whole lot of like narcissism within that Louisville music scene where people are like looking to be in photo shoots or give away mystery or explicate everything. And so it was very compelling that they made such amazing music, but were also hard to confirm who was who or who did what or what was going on. And so stories would kind of spread about them because other people were very similarly fascinated or curious and knew bits and pieces of information. So if you were at, you know, record stores or traveling or touring with bands in that early 90s time period, you would end up in Chicago and someone would be like, oh man, David Pajo was just here playing with Stereo Lab. And man, we heard this crazy story about what the other person's up to right now. So kind of befriending some of them or tracking them down or getting to know them when they were kind of in their own forms of seclusion in the early to mid nineties was important to me as like a, a fan of their work and their music. 
and then eventually becoming the person to tell some of those stories or uh, put a little bit of information about them into the structure of the film was a very satisfying and rewarding thing to do with their cooperation and them telling stories on camera and being interviewed. It was super cool. Um, and Andy, you got any uh, any pieces of this uh, filmography or, or work yeah. you want to jump into here? Well, I'm yeah, I'm curious. How did you end up uh, first getting hooked up with the the Jackass guys? What was the the your your that came path through into that through Spike Jones? So I'd done stuff with uh, Nirvana and Pavement and REM, sort of like early '90s music culture stuff, and then. The band Sonic Youth, I shot Super 8 of them when they were touring with R.E.M. in uh, May of 1995. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to make a really beautiful song called The Diamond Sea. It's about mm -hmm. 20 minutes long on the album Washing Machine. They were going to try and make like a music video because everyone kind of realized like that song stands out on that album as like the the really significant key melodic and conceptual and, and time spanning piece of music. And that they wanted to make like a, you know, like a seven minute long version that could potentially get played on radio or be a video that MTV might show on 120 minutes. And Spike Jones was a very well-regarded, amazing filmmaker who was doing music videos at that time period, who had made earlier work with Sonic Youth and was friendly with Kim Gordon and Thurston Moore. So they asked him to, to make a video for it. And then they mentioned that this younger filmmaker, Lance Bangs, had been filming them on Super 8 while traveling, you know, when they played that that material live early in the in the spring, so Spike asked to kind of meet up and, and get a hold of the Super Eight that I've been shooting, and I sent him everything. I thought he would just take the parts of Sonic Youth, but he went through all the raw footage and found, you know, the kind of like poetic Super Eight of friends, events yeah. or graduations or some of the Athens people hanging out or fragments of other things and clouds out the window and and kind of wove that into the video for the song itself. And then he very generously shared the directing credit with myself and another great filmmaker, Dave Markey, who had did The Year That Punk Broke, the film with Sonic Youth and Nirvana. Mm -hmm. um, rather than just like crediting it to himself or, you know, a thing that plenty of other people might have done, he like uh, put my name on it and Dave Markey's name on it in a way that MTV had to kind of put our name up on screen. And that sort of opened a lot of doors of people becoming more aware of the filmmaking that I was doing, the things that I was making while I was like mostly hiding out in Athens, Georgia and traveling mm -hmm. in that region that suddenly, you know, record labels in New York and LA were in London were like, Oh, like, will you come make a video for, you know, whatever other bands that we're doing at that time. So that kind of led to me doing more stuff with Spike from that point on, I uh, became good friends and collaborated, had a good time making things together, like, you know, directing projects together, doing documentaries or concert films or music things. And then he was friendly with Johnny Knoxville, who's just like a, bright, funny, sharp writer that was doing uh, whatever gigs he could to get by, like appearing in short films or commercials or writing articles from magazines in the 90s. And just in the weirdo version of L.A., like Knox was such a charismatic, smart, funny, good guy to have a drink with or go ride around in his car, you know, talk about life or whatever books you're reading. And then Knoxville did that first self-defense test where for a print magazine article, like it was like, if you're going to go <laughs> with your idea of like testing out, you know, getting shot with rubber bullets and bear mace and electrocution <laughs> from a taser to see how they feel and write about it. Why not have a video camera and film it? And then he had the big idea he's leading up to for the article of like testing out a bulletproof vest and essentially only had the money to buy like the least expensive bulletproof vest <laughs> and ask the person like, will this stop a bullet? And the guy is kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, you get what you pay for. And then, you know, borrowed a, a handgun and went out and everyone was kind of too nervous to want to be there and like tested out getting shot fairly point blank into the bulletproof vest and survived. And the footage is terrifying, but also amazing. And then, once they kind of looked at what that was and his charisma, he and Spike and their friend Jeff Tremaine were like, we should, we should make a TV series out of this. Like what, you know, like we should take this around. And so they, they took that early footage and went to like MTV and Comedy Central and HBO and sort of figuring out like, would anyone let us make a show where we don't clean this up? We don't turn it into like a slick thing. It's just us and our camaraderie and friendship and camcorders. And you don't ruin it with like slick, 
titles and a montage and all that. And, uh, and they fought creatively to make it what they wanted it to be and, and got it on MTV and had amazing success right away. Incredible. You, Incredible. Um, I mean, that's gone through a lot of iterations. And I think the latest one that I saw was in the Mel Brooks uh, History of the World oh, yeah. series, which I guess you were credited as the directing that segment yeah, or something like that. The, and yeah, I, uh, I had directed a, a thing with Mel Brooks like a decade ago. And at the time was worried that like, oh, I'm so glad to be directing Mel Brooks in a comedy thing. But I, I'm so glad that I got this under the wire while he's alive. Like, you know, what a great life experience. <laughs> I, when I was a child and had cable TV would see, you know, Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles and History of the World Part One. Um, and then 10 years go by and they ask if I would come direct part of History of the World Part Two. And it was like, I, I'm, it's amazing that he's still, he's, today is his 97th birthday. He's still <laughs> like writing and producing the History of the World Part Two, you know, 40 some odd years after the first one came out. Uh, it was great to get brought into that by Nick Kroll and the people that, Ike Barinholtz, that, that made History of the World with Mel Brooks producing. Um, amazing experience and, and loved it. And But yeah, what a weird place to end up from what started as like just camcorder nonsense. He seems like the kind of guy where, you know, the guy he is on camera, it's everybody seems to say that he's the same guy off, you know, you, you know, he doesn't turn into a dour, miserable yeah. person. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. Go for it, Andy. Well, so, yeah, so I, I just I want to uh, ask a little bit more about Jackass because so yeah. I, I got to say I've always been uh, a, a, a real a big fan of the the series. I was uh, I like the CK five stuff before that, and um, I, I'm just interested. You, you know, you're in from your perspective as a filmmaker. What what was it about that show and what they did that uh, ex- excited you and made you want to be a part of it? Because you know, I think there's. Uh, a group of people out there who who I'm not that I'm not a part of that would that see it as you know sort of jocks being silly, um, and 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 I, I, there's something about it that I think has always elevated it as as more than that to me. Uh, I wonder, I wonder what yeah what you think it these is. were these were all genuinely interesting strange people. They were more like SST punks. They were more like people that would have been at mm-hmm. a Minutemen concert or liking Zen Arcade by Husker Du rather than like the kind of Orange County meathead uh, extreme sports dudes. Like, you know, I think if you don't see the nuance about like what's different about Chris Pontius's use of language than just a a Mountain Dew commercial person, like it's a, it's a different thing. And so Jeff Tremaine's a great painter and, and designer and uh, interesting, smart guy who ended up being great at motivating and coaching and directing these things. Spike is a visionary person who I love being around and how much he expands my mind with the ideas that come out of him and the way he, that he teaches himself how to like make things and reinvent things and reapproach them. Johnny Knoxville is a super charismatic, funny writer uh, that you wanted to spend time in his, the sound of his voice, hearing him talk and charm people. Um, It definitely was that sort of, strange clever funniness rather than uh some kind of jockish meathead thing to me yeah um okay and um i guess uh we can there's a million things we're gonna ask about but i I do want to ask about uh the pavement film slow century um so were you involved in like because that you know kind of captures footage from like uh you know various different points in their career Were, were you filming them all along or was that footage that was assembled yeah i uh i started filming them in 1992 um at the time of slanted and enchanted and the early kind of drag city eps and then continued filming them all the way through like their final performance in november of 1999 when they broke up for the first time it was on pretty much all of that final leg of like the release of terror twilight and then the tours and you know kind of a press tour in Europe and then tours in North America and then back to Europe for kind of like the final run of shows. Um, And it shot stuff in the years in between as well and and sort of wove that all into the documentary, The Slow Century. We're actually making a new film now that I'm executive producing called Pavements uh, that Alex Ross Perry is directing. Oh, wow. Will be very interesting and fun. And 
you know, the sense was like, we'd already made like the, the documentary and this is sort of like a avant-garde deconstruction of rock docs. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> that could not be more. <laughs> yeah. Right, right up our, our alley. Uh, yeah. I need that. I need that recording on, on a four track. <laughs> I need to, I need to, to play it back. What is, what is, uh, Robert calls it bouncing at one point, to turn it into an eight track. I need, <laughs> Um, all right, but live in it. that leads me to ask, so, okay, so you were filming Pavement all along and you assembled that into a documentary. You were filming yeah. Elephant Six and, you know, what we call Elephant Six all along, these people, and Sonic Youth, you mentioned. Okay, so, like, what other great musicians have you been filming all along that you just haven't gotten around to make the documentary about yet? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of things. There's a weird, there's, like, a Slater-Kinney documentary that we were pretty deep in, and then we just kind of shifted to them working on new stuff, and we didn't put it out or completed at the time i made an entire feature length documentary with the band arcade fire during the time of the first record i was like in the band with them for that whole release of the first record and tour and that during that time period like david bowie walks into the room on camera and like meets them and starts collaborating with them david byrne walks into the room with them on camera and starts you know doing songs with them that sort of like rise from like this you know weird troop of people from montreal growing and ending up like on these massive stages and doing shows with you two at the end of that, that tour was, uh, was pretty insane. And, and at the time it felt like, uh, like it'd be too presumptuous to like put out a feature film after your first record, like let's hold on to this and wait. And then now because of changing dynamics, I don't know that that'll ever get released or seen or, or screened or whatever, but like that film was very satisfying to, to make and exists in, in my archives and vault. Uh, hmm. I ended up making, a documentary about the band the gossip that was like very fun and mm-hmm. had a lot of great wild footage of them coming out of arkansas and being in olympia at the time that olympia was a very fertile music scene similar to athens but with like different kind of characters and different wardrobe and outfits and and sounds and sensibilities so there's that sort of like olympia washington gossip uh documentary that exists i contributed some footage to a, a film for the band fugazi that's been screening in different places uh that they kind of wanted it to run in in DC area as a benefit at first. And and other people that knew that those screenings had happened have asked to kind of run it in New York and Philly and Pennsylvania and other places. And we kind of want to keep it small. The people that curated that Jeff Krulik, Joe Gross, uh, they wanted to not make it like a broad release, but make it something that you had to show up for and pay $5 to get into a movie theater and be in, a crowd of other people and experience it together. And so uh, Joseph Patterson is the other person that that was involved in kind of curating that. But we're going to line up more screenings for that, um, that people will get a chance to see that amazing Fugazi footage from over the years. Uh, I did a lot of stuff with Odd Future. I filmed mm. Tyler the Crater and Earl Sweatshirt and Frank Ocean and the other people in that world from the time that they were like, you know, adolescents or teenagers in this neighborhood and kind of the Fairfax district of, of uh, California and shot all that early material and, and made some of their music videos and concert pieces and things like that back at that time. Um, I think that at some point that footage will probably end up into a documentary in some form. Um, those are the main ones I can think of that are like the furthest along, but I've compulsively filmed, you know, other artists and performers and things that I was fascinated by or drawn to over the years and, and, got a lot of footage of sean marshall pat power from over the years i love mm. will oldham who's performed as palace music and palace brothers and bonnie prince billy and every iteration that he's done um yeah there's a lot that i'm still drawn to and i get excited about bands that are active now like i am working with you know bands that inspire me there's a great musician from chicago named gia margaret that i'm making a bunch of pieces with uh i love her recordings and i hope that people get as much out of them as i do um yeah there's a band named wednesday from Asheville that i'm excited oh, about that i'd like to start wednesday. making some stuff with yeah we're huge fans yeah yeah um okay well, wednesday wednesday actually reminds me a little bit of the the some of the I, I had them on my mind watching this movie a lot because uh because there's sort of this um recurring discussion that that this stuff could only have happened in um Athens, you know, that, that there's another discussion about like 
there's only there's some albums that couldn't happen in New York City because you wouldn't be able to gather in the way that they they were able to gather. Um, it makes me think about um, about Wednesday and that that their music seems of a of an actual place as opposed yeah. to sort yeah. of a, um, just a, a generalized sound. Yeah. Okay. For people that aren't familiar, Asheville, North Carolina, which is where Wednesday are coming out of, is a very supportive, fertile area for people to go and make visual art or live interesting lives or make music or collaborate with each other. There's a, a lot to do there. And a lot of people are ending up in Asheville. Mm -hmm. I cannot stop myself from saying that um, I'm like, and Andy knows I never shut up about this, but I am a huge fan of Slater, Kenny and, and Corin. And um, I thought about wearing one of my like collection of nineties uh, vintage Slater Kenny shirts that I picked up at a show uh, for this recording, but then I thought perhaps you would think I was an insane person, so I decided not to do that. But uh, um, anyway, um, I would love to see uh, any footage of them, uh, you know, come out because um, just uh, one of the greatest rock bands of all time. So right? um, pass along the, uh, the 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 love. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> um, all right, uh, I think we did it, Andy. What do you say? I th I would say so. Um, <laughs> um, boy, yeah, I, your your serenity around all of these projects that are finished and you're you've you've completed, and uh, that may or may not ever see see uh, you know be screened for people is uh, admirable. I would I would be a nervous wreck about all of that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. you seem you seem very comfortable about it. No, like I've I've just enjoyed all of this uh, yeah. making things, and I I do project things for friends and. We, there's like a great concert film we made called Arthur Fest with like Yoko Ono and Cat Power and Sonic Youth and Slater Kinney. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things we've made that are uh, in the archives and I do screen them and project them sometimes in small gatherings or for friends. But uh, at some point, hopefully, I just love things being projected. I don't want them to just like slip out on the Internet. I'd mm -hmm. rather that someone like saw it on a wall moving through the air to hit it. Yeah. Well, um, thank you so much for, uh, not just for your time, but for all the um, amazing work that you've done. Because uh, you've, uh, as fans of uh, music, um, of comedy, of uh, film, documentary, all these things that you've worked in, um, you've, uh, you've given us all a lot uh, that has uh, been entertaining, fun, beautiful, amazing. So thank you for doing oh, that. You. And thank you for yeah. spending, spending some time with us. We, we yeah. were thrilled when you agreed to do it. Yeah. And again, the uh, the Elephant Six recording company coming out through Greenwich uh, Entertainment on August 25th. And then it'll be available like over video on demand through like iTunes and Amazon and places like that uh, shortly after it's in theaters. And I'm just so happy that it's actually like in theaters being projected. Uh, that means a lot to me. And, uh, you know, it wasn't something that was done by any one person. It was a, a group of us that CB Stockfleth uh, and Rob Hatch Miller and Greg King all kind of contribute a huge amount to make the film what it is. And we're happy that people are going to see it. Yeah. If you're listening to this uh, episode, when it comes out, then that, you know, should be shortly before the film comes out. So um, please go see it in the theater. I, I mean, you were nice enough to sc share a screener with us, but uh, this would definitely be one that uh, yeah, Andy yeah. and I can, uh, can duck out and, uh, and, and catch in the theater if it uh, comes to a, if we're fortunate enough that it comes to a theater near us. So um, either way. Yeah. Thanks for doing it. And um yeah, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us on Rock Docs. Right on. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for listening to Rock Docs. If you like what you heard, please go ahead and leave us a review. Apple Podcasts, wherever it helps other folks find out about the show. Uh, Rock Docs is a treble media podcast. Treble is a fully independent media outlet devoted to music. You can find out more at treblezine.com. If you'd like to support the community of writers and creators behind Treble, please head to patreon.com slash treblezine. And thanks again to Lance Bangs for being awesome. Everybody appeared on everybody's record. It's like, oh, we need viola. We need a trumpet. I remember it feeling very mysterious to me. The misleading thing was that we all lived in a house together. One giant, loving, music-making flop shack. In the airplane over the sea was not just a record people liked, but was this phenomenon. Now we are young, let us lay in the sun and I had never heard anything orchestrated quite like that. It's an amazing, provocative work. 
We came from a little town in Louisiana where we were kind of closed off from the world. You know, we all just sort of fell in love with making music together and making tapes for each other. We got an organ with one note that works and a banjo with two strings. What else do you need? There was a message of hope inside the super fuzz bass. They're weirdos, and I love them. The idea that what we were doing would find an audience was pretty improbable. It seemed like more than just bands, it was like a movement. Can I think of another scene that comes close to that? Absolutely not. Your curiosity will certainly be satisfied.